Hello, I'm Dr. Winnie King, and I'm here with some experts in the lobby of the Children's Hospital in Montefiore in New York City. So you'll probably hear some noise in the background. It's all part of the environment. Chances are you've seen someone with a vertical scar on their mouth. Not a big deal, right? It's probably a sign that they were born with a cleft lip or a cleft lip and a cleft palate. But to understand what that really means and what you can do about it, you need to meet Brianna Frieri, a vibrant little girl who has had more medical treatment in eight years than most people have in a lifetime. I am eight years old. I like to ride my bike. Cool. That one was good. I think I have had like five or four surgeries. Okay. I've been studying karate for three years. Yeah. Very nice. It has helped me a bit with, I'm not really scared anymore too much. A cleft lip occurs because somewhere in your pregnancy, usually um, early on in your pregnancy, the lip doesn't close completely. In Brianna's situation, it was both the lip and the palate, which is the roof of the mouth. A cleft lip is when you lip like you have nothing here and it kind of looks like that. And um, a cleft palate is when there's like nothing up here, I think. My husband Jerry was in the, um, in the room when I gave birth and he probably realized earlier on than I did that there was something wrong. The fear that I saw um, in my doctor's eyes, you know, I, I heard him say, you know, we have a problem. I was completely taken off guard. Uh, there's no history in my family. There's no history in my husband's family. One of the first complications we dealt with due to Brianna's birth defects were feeding issues. Because the palate is open and the lip is open, the formula can come out and, and comes through her nose. When I spoke to the specialists, they advised me that it was very possible that Brianna would be undergoing a number of surgeries. It could be anywhere from seven or eight over her lifespan to 18 or 19. The, the first surgery was probably the most difficult. It was at three months. That was to close the lip initially. The next three surgeries, each surgery became progressively easier. In the beginning, I threw up a lot because of the anesthesia, but after a while, I got used to it. We knew what to anticipate. Uh, we became more comfortable with ourselves and, and helping her through her recovery. If I knew then what I know now, I don't think I would have been so overwhelmed. Her personality tends to be that she's strong. But I, I think that she's also very sympathetic and compassionate. I'm just so proud to be Brianna's mom. I never thought that she would turn out as wonderful as she is inside and out. And Karen and Brianna are here with us now. And Brianna, I understand that you're really good with karate, right? Yes. Well, can you show us a move? Wow, wow, that's really cool. You're very, very scary. <laughs> well, and sitting next to her is this very nice gentleman, uh, Dr. David Staffenberg, who is a plastic surgeon, and he's one of the renowned team of Montefiore surgeons you may have heard about who separated conjoined twins that were joined at the head. Now, David has also performed several cleft lip and palate surgeries on Brianna. And uh, let's, let's start out with the definition of this. How does this whole thing happen, the cleft lip? Well, cleft lip and palate occurs early in pregnancy when the two halves of the lip don't fuse together completely. And the same thing can happen in the roof of the mouth where that doesn't fuse together. So when we're looking at these graphics here, this is an incomplete cleft lip, but you can see that the lip hasn't completely fused. But when it's more severe, it can open right up into the nose. And that can even be bilateral. And you can see here a bilateral cleft lip. Are most children born with either or, either a cleft lip or a cleft palate? Right. Uh, any child can have either a cleft lip alone, a cleft palate alone, or both together. Yeah. Is this a common birth disorder de defect? It's interesting. It's actually more common than people think. It's about 1 in 700. So like our conjoined twins might be 1 in 10 million births. This is 1 in 700 births. Yeah. And around the world it has different in in incidents, mm -hmm. and we're not quite sure exactly why that is. 
I'm sure that when this happens, and I know, Karen, you, you felt this, you start wondering, did I do something wrong in the pregnancy? Was it a mistake that I made? Is this something that is the result of something you did in pregnancy, or is it inherited? The vast majority of cases have nothing to do with anything that the parents have done. It has nothing to do with either of the family histories. But there are cases which can be genetic. There are cases where the cleft lip and palate can be part of a broader picture. And so it becomes extremely important to see the proper specialist early on. Now, obviously, the cosmetic issues are what catches everybody's attention, but does this need to be treated or can you leave it alone? Right. Well, as you said, there are cosmetic implications, but aside from what we see, there are also functional problems, not just having to do with the appearance of the cleft lip or having to do with communication and proper speech with the cleft palate, but problems with hearing can also be encountered, uh, problems with dentition, with tooth growth and proper alignment of the teeth. So it's a much broader picture and all of it's very important to treat. So it's a lot more complicated than it looks like just from the outset. That's the most important thing to know and, and that it's so important to get involved with the right specialist at the beginning. Now, Brianna's already had several surgeries. How many surgeries does it take to correct this? Well, in most cases, in the most involved cases where there is a cleft lip and a cleft palate, those are fixed before the age of one. Then there is typically a, an operation on the gum line for the adult teeth to come in properly before the age of 10, and then maybe a rhinoplasty or surgery on the nose when they're teenagers. So yeah. that's typically about four operations, but in more severe cases, it can be much, uh, much more involved than that. And Karen, I know this was so upsetting to you to have, first of all, to have this happen, and then to have the doctors tell you that your brand new little, tiny little baby has got to go under anesthesia and have surgeries. Um, how many surgeries has Brianna had? Tell us about them. Brianna's had four surgeries so far. The first surgery was done at three months, the most scary. Uh, that was to close the lip initially. Uh, around the time that she was a year old, we had the palate closed, and then uh, we had two additional surgeries. The last surgery was uh, a bone graft, which Dr. Staffenberg was just speaking about, above the bone line, above the teeth line, um, where he actually took a portion of her hip mm -hmm. and rebuilt the bone above her teeth so that her second teeth would come in. And it's so obvious, you know, with the pictures that you showed us, David, you know, of the, the defect in the mouth, but is it always obvious or can this be missed, even by doctors sometimes? It's, it's not so obvious all the time and it may not be visible. And in some cases, we've had parents who have been insistent that something's not right. In some cases, before the child even speaks, it may simply be the symptom that formula is coming out the nose and it may be a problem that only affects the muscle in the cleft palate, but you can't see anything abnormal so it's important to be seen and then in older children they may have difficulty with speech uh, we may hear too much air coming through the nose mm -hmm. but yet when you look at them everything looks normal but that's also a symptom of, of a possible cleft palate now I understand that you have an animation that you've made to uh, illustrate the surgeries that are done mm -hmm. let's let's go through that and help us to understand how you do this because these are little teeny little children and it's just um, hard to imagine that you can do something like that what right. are we looking at here well what we're looking at here you can see a tongue at the bottom of the screen and you're looking at a normal palate on the top of the screen. The red strip is the normal muscle that runs across the soft palate. But when we have a cleft palate, which is shown right here, the muscle can't go across that cleft, so it's in an abnormal position, which you see here. So when we do this operation, one of the techniques we use, you can see us making these Z-shaped incisions, yeah. and we're actually elevating up these flaps, and you can see the red muscle in there, which we're now reorienting mm -hmm. into a better position, and we close up the palate, and the operation's finished. It's amazing. Okay, so it's not enough that you're like this incredible surgeon, that you're world renowned, that you've done all these incredible things. You're also a filmmaker too. I mean, what other skills did you have that we need to know about? That's incredible, but that's such a good way of showing exactly how this whole thing works. Now, Karen, do you have to be an advocate in this whole thing as the parent, coordinating all of the different doctors to make sure that your child gets the right care? Coordination is the key to success. Um, it's imperative to work with a hospital where you can come and meet uh, specialists like an ear, nose, and throat, a speech pathologist. Um, recently, Brianna and I have been seeing an orthodontist um, that also specializes uh, with cranial facial patients. So the coordination and uh, staying on top of the surgical plan is imperative, following the plan, uh, knowing that certain surgeries should be done in line with certain age certain ages so that she can minimize uh, the amount of speech impediments. 
Now, has her hearing been affected by all this? Her hearing was affected earlier on. Uh, due to the cleft palate, uh, she developed a great deal of fluid in her ears. And with that can come not only middle ear infection, but also permanent hear hearing loss. Right. Um, and that in itself can also um, impact the speech. So it's imperative to stay on top of that, to work with the ear, nose, and throat. She had tubes placed in her ears uh, during one of her surgeries. Yeah. Well, Brianna, I know this has been quite an ordeal for you. How have your friends and other kids at school reacted to all of this? Kids react. Sometimes they are nice, sometimes they're mean. Sometimes they're mean to you? Not really, that doesn't usually happen, unless they're like a bully or something. Unless they're a bully. And what do you do if they're mean to you? You usually ignore them, and then they eventually stop. Yeah. Well, that's a good idea, because you're such a pretty girl, and I can't imagine why anybody would be mean to you. But it's good to know that you're fine and you're going to be okay. Uh, Karen, what have you learned in all of this? You know, for parents watching that have just been told, you know, we've got a problem, we've got to do something about it, what do you want them to know? Well, as I mentioned on the tape, you know, I wish I knew then what I know now. I certainly would not have been so overwhelmed and afraid. Um, I think parents should know that, you know, surgeons uh, like Dr. Staffenberg are available and, and this is repairable. Um, this experience has certainly um, enabled Brianna to be much more resilient and yes. strong. Um, I can see that she's empathetic to other children and to other people. Yeah. Well, you know, out of every experience, good things can happen. It's all about the way in which you handle it. Thanks to all of you all for being here on the show today. To learn more about cleft lip and cleft palate, you can contact the Cleft Palate Foundation, and their website is cleftline.org. The phone number is 919-993-9044. And also the Center for Craniofacial Disorders at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, and their web address is montykids.org. The phone number is 718-741-2323. We'll see you next time on Keeping Kids Healthy.